This is Pete Moore on Halo Talks NYC. I have the pleasure of having my good friend, Rick Caro, one of the original founders in the industry with the URSA Trade Association. We've come a long way since those early days of trying to figure out how to get people healthy. So um, I'm happy to have Rick on the show. Rick, uh, always good to see you. Well, thanks, sir. Appreciate being here. So Rick runs a, uh, a consulting firm, um, Management Vision, out of New York. We've collaborated on several clients over the last 10 years and have known each other for since 1999. So I'm looking forward to this podcast. And I think what, what would be the best thing to do is basically create almost like a, a little bit of a history lesson, as you referenced, um, you know, where we came from, where we're headed, you know, and, and understand um, why some of the... Uh, the methodologies and processes that we have might not uh, be something we need to hold on to, but um, you know, we got to continue to innovate and provide results. So when I have you kick it off and just give you a quick background for those who've a couple of people who don't know who you are, and then we'll jump into some of the breakthroughs over the last, you know, 30 years. Well, thanks. Um, I've been in the industry a long time now. I guess I'm starting my uh, 46th year. Um, which may be older than most of the people who are listening. Um, and uh, I started with an, as an owner-operator and was there in the early days uh, where we were, in effect, creating what we now call multi-sport clubs. We didn't even have a name for it then. Mm -hmm. We sold those, and then I have a chance to become not only a founder of URSA, but also a consultant uh, to people who knew me in the industry and others who were seeking out uh, information when there frankly weren't many uh, people who could provide that service. Uh, so I had a chance to grow up with the industry, mm -hmm. um, learn at the expense of the industry, but also be able to be a good sharer and give back to uh, others who weren't as far along. So I was blessed, and today I'm uh, f having a chance to ha sit on some nonprofit boards, but more importantly, some for-profit vendors who serve the industry and, uh, and one major club company uh, uh, board, the Bay Club Company out of California, uh, that's backed by a major uh, uh, investment group. So it's great fun. It's great to be able to be with up and coming stars in the industry. It's great to see people develop. And more importantly, it's great to see the industry mature. Yeah, I think, um, you know, back in 1999, I think there were a, a whopping two private equity firms that owned any assets in the health club industry. And you and I were always trying to um, convince people how these uh, health club chains were different than Bally. So we always had to uh, explain away. Uh, some of the black eyes in the industry and some of the, the paid in full memberships that uh, people were selling and then the clubs that uh, were in pre-sale for into perpetuity <laughs> and they actually never opened, which, you know, has been taken care of by EFT transfers and, and also uh, some governmental regulations on bonding. Um, but why don't, why don't you start off with a couple of key you know, points or, or like pivots that the comp that the, that the industry has taken that you view as like, Hey, this is what kind of started the, the, the interest from investors and created like sustainable businesses. Well, it starts with one you just mentioned, which is electronic funds transfer. This was really probably the major breakthrough for the industry because previously people either paid cash upon each visit or paid up front. And that led to no predictability of the business in some cases, poor or uh, shoddy bookkeeping. It also led to a mentality where people paid in advance, prepaid for one year, two years, three years, and even what was called lifetime uh, memberships. This meant that it was hard to run a business that way, hard to figure out how to match up revenues and expenses. Mm -hmm. It led to some wheeling and dealing of the worst kind and bad consumer practices. And with EFT, when it came along, club leaders now could actually run their businesses properly. And it led to outsiders for the first time being able to understand the business, which they hadn't understood before. And in my view, it changed the industry. It was a fundamental sea change for the industry. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's almost, con I, I kind of chuckle now when I hear about all these um, direct-to-consumer businesses and like, hey, we got to get people on a monthly subscription. And, you know, this is, you know, the next best way to, to run a recurring revenue business. And I'm like, hello, we've been doing this for 25 years. Where the hell have you been? You know, we've been doing this. We kind of set the standard of how to do this. 
It, it was interesting. In one of my markets, we aligned ourselves with the largest consumer um, based bank, uh, largest commercial bank in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And we had them serve as the processing firm for the electronic funds transfer. And people literally thought the bank and ourselves were thieves because we're going to take money out of the account, couldn't be assured it was the right amount of money, that we might take more out or more frequently. And so we really had, a, as an industry, a credibility gap that took a while to overcome. Today, it's a standard and everyone understands it. But in the initial stage, it was really very difficult to educate a marketplace. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was definitely one of the big, you know, important parts of the business model from a recurring monthly standpoint. Um, what do you got next? Well, I, I think, you know, one of the things we had was an awful lot of people probably needed guidance and advice, et cetera. And this is an industry that didn't have educated leaders, talent, and uh, people to really help people learn how to use equipment, learn what was best for their body, learn how to exercise properly. So we found for the first time institutions, educational institutions that were now creating bachelor's science and even master's classes in things like exercise science. And they became funnelers for people with knowledge to join the industry and help what I call innocence to go through with proper exercise and use of equipment. And what that led to was, led to was careers for these people who stayed with the industry. And then they were smart enough to then improve themselves by getting certifications, real certifications, not uh, continuing education uh, weekends and thinking that that was all they should do. But more importantly, it led insurance companies for the first time to get comfortable with the industry so that they would actually underwrite liability coverages, which they were uncomfortable doing. And finally, it led to now such credibility that we have people who, with pre-existing conditions, with real medical issues, with people who, in effect, are feeling that they really need hand-holding to start, especially if they're older and haven't been a frequent exerciser. So for the first time, we are an industry that now has credibility, but that was not the case back in some years ago. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, the, the whole uh, paradigm has shifted. I think part of it, because you're not doing paid in full, memberships like we talked about and you're actually like focused on helping people get results versus just selling them access you know and um you know see if that if they get the results they want on a machine like that's that's obviously we're we're creating real change and if you think about it there are still a lot of full-time uh, first-time exercisers that don't have confidence they're going to succeed so right. they need to have someone coach them to tell them what they can and cannot do and in some cases, really manage their expectations of how they're going to get launched and how they're going to maintain whatever their favorite type of experience is in the club. So it, it's a real breakthrough. Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously when you were doing this originally on the, uh, on the sporting sports center side, you know, a lot of these larger entities kind of started as, as tennis clubs and racket clubs and then kind of morphed into health clubs. Um, so, what, you know, what, we'll talk a little bit about, as I, as I see on this, this sheet here, you know, how, you know, differentiation happened and, and kind of what, what the cause of that was. And Well, it, it started with the physical plant because what we had was in the early days, we had fitness-only clubs that were tiny. They were really small. And sometimes they were so small, they had one locker room and they had alternate day use. So the <laughs> men were Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The women were Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, the reverse. I didn't know um, this. I've only seen that on a track where you like run on the track in different directions. So you no, don't this, screw up the turf. This, this I didn't is, know about the locker rooms. These are small physical plants. And then we had, at that time, very minimal fitness equipment. And when I started my first club, we had choices of um, cardiovascular equipment, but it wasn't electronic. It was a manual, so we had a chance to crank, uh, turn a crank and change the, in effect, uh, resistance on an exercise bike, and that's all we had to work with. There were no treadmills and ellipticals, et cetera. And when the uh, tennis clubs and racquetball clubs came along and became multi-sport clubs by converting some of the uh, space so that fitness and racket sports combined under one, uh, in one building, 
-hmm. Then all of a sudden they decided they needed more and more uh, development of these multi-sport elements. So gymnasiums and indoor swimming pools were added. In some cases, childcare, much greater locker rooms than the initial ones. Um, and in some cases, they had an outdoor component. Mm -hmm. That led to, at the same time, equipment started to develop. So we had our first electronic cardiovascular equipment uh, came along. Then we also had strength equipment that was now aimed at particular individual pieces for each part of the body, where before it was a um, multi-station kind of experience. And then finally, what we ended up with is some of the amenities that we know today. So locker rooms now added saunas and steam rooms, food and beverage came along. The outdoor components often included a swimming pool, which led to socialization and a lot of other things that we know today. But when we started, these were plain, vanilla, limited facilities. And the good news is when you change the offerings, you now can talk to greater audiences. And so the, that led to the next point, which was we now could diversify who the audience were going after. So our customer base expanded. When I came in the industry, we catered to fitness fanatics, as I call them, mm -hmm. which were often power lifters, aerobics crazies, free weight users, etc. We then added the racket sport users that I talked about, but then it expanded to seniors, families, youths, now millennials, group exercise only takers who wanted just a particular type of uh, experience, so mm -hmm. a cycling only, a kickboxing or boxing only, uh, Pilates only, and now we have, what, seven, eight different types of yoga, and not everyone wants more than just one type of yoga orientation. So we now have different kinds of needs, and we're service, servicing them differently. We also have people who want to pay only so much for their membership or are price insensitive and want whatever the full package is and are willing to pay up for it. We learned also that this is an industry where you need to often have triers um, because they can't figure it out even though today with the internet, um, you would think they could research a lot of things, but often people need to walk around, feel and touch it, see how busy it is at key times, see whether they can access whatever they want, mm -hmm. see uh, what the education backgrounds are on perhaps some of the personal trainers that they might want to use. So they have to come in and experience it. What it led to was that it now could really serve more audiences. So with the opportunity to change the mix of what we're offering and with smarter people, we now could reach out to the outdoor only exercisers who now came inside because whatever training they might need during cold weather climate where they can't do perhaps the outdoor experience, mm -hmm. we now could serve as a training experience for them, such as uh, triathletes, et cetera. And home fitness users decide to combine home and uh, commercial clubs. And what that also led to for the first time, as I alluded to earlier, is with more credibility, we could talk to people with medical issues. So as you've, you know, you've lived and breathed this industry, you know, effectively since its inception, do you feel, you know, if you, if you use your crystal ball here, you know, and there is like some kind of economic you know, lull, if you will. I don't think we're going into a recession anytime soon, but, you know, how do you view the sustainability of all the different players in the space? And do you think that there's too much experimentation that's gone on? You know, like I look at a restaurant chain and I, you know, you realize, okay, there could be a burger joint on every, you know, on all four corners because people, you know, supposedly eat three times a day, but actually probably eat more like five times a day. So there's definitely enough traffic and there's enough consumption. You know, when you look at a, um, you know, someone opening up a, a Planet Fitness across the street from a New York sports club, across the street from an Edge Fitness, so, you know, at some point you kind of scratch your head and say, well, is this, is there enough of a population in this area or is it basically just, you know, creating this unnecessary level of competition, you know, where that other group should maybe go down the road, you know, a couple of miles and not, you know, square off against each other. So how do you kind of calibrate the we'd love to have everybody working out every day, but that's not realistic. And, you know, is competition the biggest risk in this industry from an investment standpoint? Well, I, I think, you know, this is no different than any other service business where supply and demand have to work. Mm -hmm. And every site 
has to look at its specific market close to it and determine whether what it needs to do to succeed. So if it's a me too copycat, it's going to have a harder time than someone who's completely differentiated and positioned mm -hmm. to offer something that's not being offered by others in the immediate area. So if you go to the whole idea of positioning, this is an industry that's really matured. We've learned how to not be a me too. We've learned finally for most clubs, they don't describe themselves the way they used to when I first entered the industry as what they're not. Mm -hmm. They can tell you what they are and who they're going after. And even someone who's priced in the middle is trying to find singular things that it offers that people can recognize and come for that um, and create a value equation at a mid price, um, even if it's not very high end or very low end or very uh, differentiated, they're looking for their points of differentiation. So this is an industry that started out as pure fitness or pure multi-sport. Mm -hmm. And now we have changed, so we now have mixtures such as multi-sport that in effect has some outdoor elements or multi-sport that now has specific studios that um, um, rival a studio only experience because they've decided that they're gonna be a specialist in a particular area. Mm -hmm. We in effect have also found that when you talk about competition, we have to look at the full definition of competition. So it's not just another commercial club. We now have corporations who have built things inside their headquarters and now created corporate fitness facilities. We have residential buildings that also have more complete fitness offerings so people don't doesn't have to leave. They don't have to leave either their uh, high-rise building or their complex if they're in a gated community. They can go right to a fitness center that's right part of their environment. We have hotels and resorts that have built larger facilities and opened them up to the local market in a membership basis. We have country clubs that figured out that they need to go after the non-golfer and have actually built fitness centers on their uh, golf club property. We have hospital and health systems that have created full wellness centers. And we have nonprofits that have built competitive facilities. So one of the challenges we have is there's more and more competition. Mm -hmm. The two major categories which everyone in the industry recognizes are the fastest growing are, are twofold. One is the boutique studio, often the single activity only category. And there are, you know, nine, 10, 12 different kinds of uh, facilities that are one activity only, cycling only, yoga only, bar class, Pilates, boxing, kickboxing, hit, high intensity interval training. Um, in some cases, rowing, running, stretching, you name it. Um, and the other fast growing category is the HV slash LP, high volume, low price, mm -hmm. which is, has a sea of equipment. Did you come up with that term, by the way? I feel like you might be the author of that term. I, I think I was an early... Um, I think you were an early HVLP guy. I think I, think I helped do, develop I think you, that. I think you did. I'm, I'm attributing it to you whenever it comes up. So. And I think we launched it at one of the URSA financial panels yes. that we had. And so I think that's where the panelists from the finance industry uh, uh, kind of adopted it. And now it seems to be uh, in print and everywhere. Um, Kind of like the halo sector. <laughs> right. um, and so, um, and so they, we have these new um, uh, clubs of, in some cases, um, as I said, a huge amount of equipment. Some have added other uh, elements and to be more diversified. But the, what that has led to is clubs have figured out that they have to really eliminate the old scatter sh uh, uh, shot marketing and where they in effect go with advertising, mass media, or in some cases, uh, blanket direct mail. And they're now doing more targeted things that make more sense. So they're now doing, um, in some cases, uh, going to online uh, communication, greater reliance on their current users to help identify prospects. Uh, recruiting former members back, which seems to be a major category, mm -hmm. um, and putting a greater emphasis on promotions and local event management. So the good news is um, that clubs are telling their marketplace in a systematic way who they are, telling about their positioning, 
and not necessarily uh, sounding like they're one of a number of clubs of a certain type. I mean, what, one of the interesting things that, you know, as you, as you go through the chronology here that I found um, really intriguing is just the amount of big box retail that, that is going to continue to go out. And there's really no alternative for landlords except for some activity-based business. So you've either got a health club when you can decide if my center is low end or low-ish end, you know, I definitely would love to have a planet come in there just because it's going to take up a big box and you'll have a thousand visits a day. Obviously, if it's high end and I can court someone like Lifetime or Bay Club or Equinox to to fill that space, I think that that rises the entire uh, strip center or or mall. But it's some of the deals that I've that I've been hearing about, you know, where the build out is being 100% covered by the landlord and the rents that are, are being pushed out are, are, are pretty unbelievable, almost like once in a lifetime type of rents. Um, and then you can finance all the equipment and put a little bit of money down. So, you know, do you see going forward as the landlords are basically trying, you know, the health club industry is bailing out the real estate industry? Well, I, I think it's part of the solution. Unfortunately, some of the square footage in shopping malls is huge. And mm -hmm. so a health club can only solve a small portion of that. Mm -hmm. But the ingredients of a health club are exactly what retail needs, which is we are traffic developers. We are, in some cases, repeat users of the same people. So, there are, so there's a predictable level of usage. Mm -hmm. uh, in many cases, we have a very desirable clientele who, in effect, um, make it attractive for others to go there, they're not feeling uncomfortable with the particular profile of the user. And what we've also learned through some studies that have been done is depending on who else is in that particular shopping complex, that many of our club members will actually patronize other people. So there was a study done on uh, uh, one of the major club companies that found that they were a great uh, set of spenders for sporting goods stores. So you will often now see in some shopping centers a major anchor that's a health club, one of the major health club companies, and a Dick's Sporting Goods in the same place. That's not coincidental. There's mm -hmm. a cause and effect. So we, we have, uh, we're a part of a solution. We may not be the only one. And we're early into it. This is not a case where we've all figured out how to change our mix or what is it that will work in a shopping center that may be different than in a retail community and then in a residential community or near residential. And so we're kind of learning also mm -hmm. and, and trying to figure out how to adapt our current offerings for that new environment. So there's obviously been a lot of private equity that's been in the space. You know, the, the planets are definitely, you know, a coveted land grab. Um, I think 17 plus private equity firms are in the planet network. There's probably five in the Orange Theory network, probably another five on the way. You know, as you consult with private equity firms, as you talk to owner operators that are in the market, um, you know, what, what are some of the things that you're seeing as... Uh, either like the differentiator on like why groups are getting funded or, you know, anything related to like these franchise networks kind of providing almost like, um, almost like renting the corporate overhead because you can't necessarily compete with some of these larger entities. Well, f first of all, just to give a full perspective, this is an industry that's still very entrepreneurially driven. And we had very few public companies and some of the public companies got into real consumer behavior problems historically and failed. So it took us a long while to get private equity to even consider that we were a desirable alternative. Right. What they now are seeing is an understandable industry. So we have electronic funds transfer. Mm -hmm. We have boxes that can be replicable because we know that a certain type of box has worked for us previously. We can now, in effect, slot that into a different environment. And we can do more and more of those if we had the fuel, in this case, financial fuel, to grow faster. Mm -hmm. We also have learned how to create 
uh, central services so we know how to grow now and do a great job of uh, going from a small number of facilities to a larger one. So I think what we have is we have the, all the demographics that uh, investors like. We're a very attractive uh, industry in that regard. Mm -hmm. we, are, we have strong EBITDA margins. We, have, we know how to create cash flow. We know how to replicate. We know how to grow faster, although private equity has done a good job of coaching some of these companies to grow faster than they normally would. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that some of them now can prove that they can have a good exit experience because there's enough data that's now been shared that tells everyone that this is a win. And so, therefore, we have companies that have gone in not once but twice or three times into our industry because they know enough about it and know why it works. Mm -hmm. um, I think the winners in some cases are companies that are understandable and can grow fast. So some of the franchise concepts um, are very popular right now. Mm -hmm. But if I was a club company and I had a box that really worked and I could replicate that if I had the resources to go faster, we still could be a very desirable alternative for private equity. And we're seeing that in some cases, but they need to have not just one prototype, they hopefully have several. Right. And sure. so we can point to a number of um, middle market companies that are not franchise that are attracting financial support and, and well-deserved. Yeah. So we're now a maturing industry that's understandable, and we now are attracting people who now realize they can succeed from the financial standpoint, and they have enough data to know what it looks like for success because we now have that shared data that they can access and know is out there for the first time. Yeah, and I, I think one of the other themes that came up in the last uh, URSA show as well as just talking to a lot of middle market operators um, or HVLP 2.0, they clearly um, are repurposing their square footage to whatever, you know, becomes on trend. So I think there was a initial fear of like, oh, CrossFit's going to take all my best uh, fitness enthusiasts. And then, you know, you take out a racquetball court, put down some turf, get a TRX suspension center, get some ropes, get some kettlebells and bam, like I've got a, I've got your CrossFit. And I also actually have a locker room. I got cardio equipment. I got group exercise classes. So that kind of like took the wind out of the sails. I think of the average CrossFit in general. I think clubs that I've been in recently uh, have really upgraded their spinning rooms and their boot camp rooms, you know, to, to basically echo or, or copy, you know, what an Orange Theory has done. And some of them have been successful or Barry's boot camp. And some of them have, you know, created an experience with the same bikes as a soul cycle. So, so I definitely think the middle market's kind of fighting back and is not being left behind. So, you know, just kind of in closing here, what, what do you, obviously there's a lot of amazing things that have happened over the last, you know, 45 years. You probably, if I gave you a crystal ball back then, you, you probably would never have guessed that it could be this awesome. <laughs> I think from my standpoint, at least being in it from 1999 until now, the amount of private equity is kind of staggering and amazing. But like what keeps you up at night or like what's your concern. I don't think they're going to find like a pill that like, you know, handles weight loss that could people keep people out of the gym. But like, what is, what, what concerns you the most, even in light of like all this growth? I, I think two things are exciting to me, but are also big question marks. One is why is the industry not retaining members better than it has in the past, and we still have too high a percentage of people who don't stay with it. And we can think of all the excuses and all the reasons and all the things that we've tried to do, but we're not still at a point where we have a predictable story that's in effect getting people in, a bu uh, in the building mm -hmm. and then keeping them achieving what they want and staying with us long term the mm -hmm. way I think we should. I think we deserve better. And as an industry, the good news is we're still entrepreneurially driven. So we, uh, we're change artists. We keep looking for how to diagnose problems and figuring out how to make them, in effect, lessen as problems or hopefully find real solutions. Mm -hmm. The second is, and the biggest question mark for me, is where will technology help the industry? Um, we you know, started with EFT, so we helped the business to manage itself better. 
we now have data coming out and we haven't figured out exactly how to comb the data and really mine it for what it's worth and doing predictive things that we should. We're just starting to touch on things like AR and VR. We're also touching on facial recognition technology. We're touching on some of the mobile apps and the way that that can help people to navigate within the club and then in effect support them when they're not in the building and what they're doing 24 seven on days when they're not gonna be going to the club. And then finally, um, how do we really figure out how to deal with all the content that we have available um, through all the means that we can come up with. And I think what's exciting for me is the play of technology to reinforce the club experience, to get a closer relationship between member and club, to talk to the non-member who now maybe can be served outside of the four walls. All the technology I think is really a great, it's a great future opportunity for the club industry, but it keeps me up at night because I don't know how it's going to play out yet, but it's really an opportunity for all of us. That's great. Um, well, uh, in closing here, I think, you know, you've been a pivotal source and champion of, of the industry. And I think a lot of private equities, you know, probably crossed through your your, your desk, you know, almost to get like the, the uh, blessing, if you will, to say, hey, look, I'm going to put capital into this industry. Can you help me make sure I'm making the right decision? So, you know, congrats on, on what you've helped build. I think we've still got some more work to do. So I'm glad to see that you're you're continuing at it at, at full force and in and, uh, and grit, as always. And, uh, you know, I think the more capital we bring into the sector, the more people we can attract as uh, as C-level executives who can leave their day job and, and come work in our industry and, and help people uh, affect change. So thanks for everything you've done. And I think that's a good history lesson for anybody that wants to know how it how it started. So started from the bottom. Now we're here, I guess, is a some kind of hip-hop song is what I'm told. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a pleasure being here. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it.